see all of you today. If you have a bulletin handy, if you'll open it up, we'll go over the things that are going on. Uh, first of all, today being first Sunday, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper, and that will be at the end of the service this morning. If you are involved in the choir or the speaking parts of the uh, choir, we're going to have some special practices on the 23rd and 7th. That involves uh, both the play part and the music part or choir part. And then on the 14th, it's choir only. Uh, so keep those dates in mind. Those are all Saturdays. So that's um, in addition to our Sunday morning practices. 10 a.m. Okay, on those days. Family Day is the 24th this month, so keep that in mind. You know the routine for that. Then our Christmas cantata will be on um, the 15th in the 11 o'clock service. All right, that's really all I have to tell you except for one thing. I am going to break the law this morning, and I'm going to tell you who to vote for. All right? Are you ready? Vote for Jesus. All right, even so, come Lord Jesus. Because he's the only one that can really straighten this mess out. All right, let's sing 571. Let's stand together, if you're able, 571. In your hymnals, 571. <laughs> a whole lot of confidence in what's going on in this world today and, and, the, and the leaders or misleaders that we have. But Lord, we know that our true hope is in heaven. It's vested there. Lord, we look forward to spending eternity with you in new glorified bodies in a place where there is no sin, no violence, no evil at all. And, and Lord, we look forward to and long for that time. Even, even so, come. Lord Jesus, I, I, I believe it would be a wonderful thing if you would interrupt our service this morning to take us home. Amen. But, Lord, you do tell us, occupy till I come. And, Lord, as we understand that word occupy, it means do my business. And so, Lord, help us to be busy about your business until you come to take us home. 
and we'll thank you for the fruits of it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated in this penny march time. 548 in your hymnals, 548. <laughs> Amen. We got one late comer here. Bless his heart. Thank you, kids, for giving your allowances this week. <laughs> I doubt seriously whether that was happening. They probably just got that off the parents or grandparents or someone close to them. We're glad that you're here this morning. We trust the Lord has blessed you this week, and we're looking forward to the blessings of the Lord in this coming week. So trust that you will keep that in mind. We have a number of things going on this morning, so just take a quick look at our offering report for the past week. And uh, thank God for what he is doing here at our work. Uh, we have off weeks, so sometimes that's the way it is. I do want to just remind you we have a kind of a couple of quiet uh, projects going on over in the barn. So uh, if you're interested and you want to know what those are and, and want to uh, talk with the pastor, I think one has to do with the ceiling, the other has to do with some, just some, some remaining carpeting. Uh, you might want to talk to him, see how you can participate in that if you choose to do so. And uh, God, God can certainly be, uh, use that to bring honor and glory to himself through it. Uh, our missionaries this week are uh, Jim and Wright, uh, um, Myra Wright. <laughs> Boy, I, you know, I tell, talking to the pastor this morning, I said, you know, sometimes I do a little puzzle or I do a, uh, you know, a, a game of solitaire or something or whatever to kind of get my brain functioning in the morning. And it still doesn't always work. <laughs> I can't wake it up sometimes. It just, it just isn't working right. <laughs> Jim and Myra Wright, missionaries, they are furlough replacement missionaries. Pray for them. Pray for all of our missionaries. And may the Lord bless you this morning as you give. We're going to have our men come at this time, and we're going to receive their offering. And if you're visiting with us this morning, you're not under any obligation. We are glad to have you with us. And uh, if you so choose to... Uh, Give and participate. Praise the Lord. We thank you so much for coming and being with us this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for Jesus. We want to thank you, Father, for your blessings towards us. And Father, our giving is a reflection of the realization that we know that all things actually come from you. All the blessings that we've received, God, are from you. And so, Father, we pray that you'll help us 
just to practice stewardship in our life and to uh, honor that recognition of your blessing in our life. In Jesus' name we ask it for his sake. Amen.
stand together if you're able. 442 in your hymnals, 442. Is dismissed if they haven't gone already. <laughs> Five sixty eight rescue.
not fly in today's contemporary seekers friendly church because it's all about the hope that's coming and not about having a better day today. Most of the churches today, it's all about having a better day today. Well, let's pray. Before we even start, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to gather together. And as Colton reminded us this morning, thank you for the freedoms that we have to gather without fear of being harassed or threatened. Uh, and Lord, we do count that as a tremendous privilege, sometimes a neglected one, but it is a tremendous privilege. And Lord, I pray that you would help us today. Lord, we don't want to simply go through the motions of doing church today. Lord, and we know the difference between just doing religious stuff and, and an authentic worship time, Lord, is your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we sometimes as uh, independent Baptists, we shy away about talking about the Holy Spirit and, and, and begging you for his work. But Lord, we know that nothing spiritual is going to happen today apart from the work of your Spirit. And so we beg for that to happen today. Pray especially for those who may be here or listening on the live stream that don't know Christ. God, awaken them to their condition. Help them to, Lord, see that their only hope for eternal life is in Jesus Christ and repent of their sin and turn to him in faith. And then, Lord, those of us who know you, Lord, where do we start? When talking about our needs, Lord, they're, they're great. And I think that we're not even fully conscious of our greatest needs most of the time. And so I pray that you would help us. Lord, I pray especially that, again, that you would just do a work in our hearts today. For Jesus' sake, amen. All right, open your Bibles if you would like to. You may have this verse memorized, 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Selves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, first, a small disclaimer here. This, the promise at the end of this verse is not given to us. It's given to the nation of Israel. You understand that, right? The promise is not ours, but the principles are. This is a very good prescription for uh, revival, all right? And that's, that's going to kick off this series that we're going to start this morning. Um, let me ask you a question this morning. There are two things I'm going, I have purpose in my heart to do in our church family, and I like to call it a church family. It's not a church corporation, right? Church family. Two things I want to purpose to do. I want to create a culture of prayer. I, I want our church to become even, you know, we pray, but more, even more so, a, a church, a praying church. You say, well, why is that so important? Is prayer magical? No. But prayer is the vehicle to take us to God, and we desperately need Him. In fact, what we're doing this morning is a waste of time. It's a colossal waste of time if God, the Holy Spirit, is not working in our hearts this morning. And that comes in answer to serious, persistent prayer. So I want to create a culture of prayer. But there's something else I, I purpose to do in, in our church, our Sunday morning church service. We do this on Wednesday night. But our church, Sunday morning church service, I want more participation. Okay? That's the reason that I'm going to ask Gary Irwin to come up and preach this morning. <laughs> no, just kidding. Somebody fan him, pick him up off the floor. <laughs> Tim got, Tim's sticking his head out to see what's going on out there. Let, let me tell you what's, what bugs me about our, our normal church service. We... 
you folks come in and you sit down and for the most part, you watch what goes on up here. Okay, we dutifully listen uh, and we, we watch. The, the exception to that, of course, is congregational singing. The reason I love congregational singing is participatory. All of you are getting involved, all right? I, I think we do, as a church, we do too much of that spectator Christianity. I'm not getting many amens in there. Don't, well, don't be, now don't be scared because I'm, I'm not going to force participation because that really is not going to do any good, all right? But I am going to maybe, uh, let, I know this sounds radical, but like in a minute I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and kind of get you thinking. But one of the things that that will do for me is let me know that you're conscious and breathing, all right, if you're talking to me. Uh, so I'm going to ask some questions, and, and at, at times we're going to stop in the middle of sermon, and you can ask me questions maybe, all right? I, I want you to participate in what is going on. Too much of what we do in church is, again, it's, it's, like, a, it's like you're going down to the movies and you're going to watch a show, all right? In, in some churches, I mean, that is the, that's the big thing. They, that's why they have... Smoke machines and light shows, and it's all about the watching the show. But I want you to participate, all right? So I, I'm, let's start with a, a question this morning. What do you think, we got election Tuesday, what do you think is the greatest need facing our nation? Now, I I kind of tipped my hat a little bit, but what do you think is the greatest need facing, facing our nation? Is, is it a, an economic thing? Is it the abortion issue? What's the greatest need facing, facing the nation? Somebody talk to me. One at a time, though, okay? So I heard somebody up here. Okay, a lack of faith. That's a big problem. Spiritual healing. I like that one. Any? Pardon? Prayer. Prayer, we pray too much? We don't pray enough. All right. Good. Uh, what? We don't pray for the right things. Okay, good. We don't pray for the right things? Repentance. I like that one. That kind of relates to what I'm going to be talking about. What else? Our conduct. Okay. I think that would relate to Repentance, if we're not doing the right thing, we need to turn around, right? What else? Okay, you're we're talking about economic issues, all right? You guys are shooting all around it. All right? <laughs> By that, I think you're getting close, but not hitting what I'm looking for. Okay, God not being the conscience of our country, is that what you said? The focus, the focus. all right. Ah, gosh. I, I went to a conference yesterday, the small church conference. Uh, the next time that comes around, please go. I, 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 it was so, so good. They, the, the subject matter was worship. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that we, they, they dealt with. In fact, well, I'm going to shut up because this is not the time to say it. Too much media, all right. Who said it? Right over here. Moore said it. The greatest need that America has right now, and all these things you guys talked about for the most part are related to that, okay? But the greatest need that we have in America right now is a thorough ongoing, genuine revival. And I have to say genuine because they, you know, you, uh, there's a lot of, you hear a lot of in church circles about revivals on this campus and revival in this church. And, and if you look into it a little bit, you find out that it, it's not something that's lasting. And usually it's, it's based on a lot of hyper-emotionalism. That's not revival, okay? And, I, and I promise you, I'm not, in this series, I'm not out to 
solicit an emotional experience. Because that's not what revival is about. In fact, let me, it's going to, I'm so full of this subject matter this morning, it's going to be hard for me to for even rein it all in. But let me, let me give you maybe a simple concept of revival. And I'm going to talk about what some other men have said about revival in a minute. But let's say that re, the word revival means re again, Bible life. All right? So it means to bring life again into our, and we're talking spiritual life, into our lives and into our church. Okay? How, how is that going to happen? Well, Paul prayed for one of the churches. He said that you may be filled with the fullness of God. If you can remember back to your conversion when you got saved, uh, you didn't need, after you got saved, you didn't need revival because you had Bible. You were filled with God himself. You were filled with God. And here, here's what I think a revival produces, a genuine revival. We get so filled with God himself that everything else becomes trivial. That nothing really matters. That, that he just, it's not that we're praying, God, in, in revival, God come and help me. We're praying, God come and take over. Fill my life with yourself so that my, my life will demonstrate you in me. To me, that's revival. It, I, again, I, I go back to, and I don't know, I, I don't want to make salvation experiences the, the standard for truth because everybody has a different salvation experience. But I think one thing that is universal is that right after we're saved, right after we're saved, that we are filled with God. That's, that's where we're in that Bible stage. That's what, in the book of Acts, you know, some people mention that the book of Acts doesn't talk about revival. Well, it doesn't have to talk about revival because those people revived. There was life because God had moved in and taken over. It's what I want for our church, all right? I, I'm not meaning to scare anybody, okay? But we, we really, we, we're, we're, for example, in this election, we're looking for men to fix the problems in this country. And I will tell you that they will not do it. In fact, as Colton pointed out, the, the potential is even if we get the person elected that we want elected, there's no guarantees that it won't be even worse. We, uh, I'm sorry. I, but I've got to say it. We have got to quit trusting men instead of trusting God. If we're going to see things really change in America, here's what's got to happen. The church has got to be revived. When the church is revived, the church is powerful because the Spirit of God is working in our lives and working through our lives and when that happens, then when we talk to people about the Lord, the Spirit of God convicts them. Right now when you talk to people about the Lord, it's like water off a duck's back. They don't care. And it's because, again, the, the Holy Spirit is not working through us to impact their lives. If... If we have a revived church, and not, not just our church, but churches all across America, if we have a revived church, then the Spirit of God works through our lives, people get saved. And when people get saved, guess what? Their lives get cleaned up. And if enough 
people get saved, the culture gets cleaned up. That's the only hope we have, folks. It's the only hope we have. And, I, and, I, and even that, there's a kind of a partial sense to it. Because we could have a revival and our, our culture could continue down the way it's going. It happens in, in communist countries, Muslim countries. The churches have a revival. They explode. They're getting, a lot of people are getting saved, but it doesn't really impact the culture. That's not the point anyway, though. I, I think we have to check our motives at the door. Why do we really want revival? Why do we really want change, maybe an administration? Well, for, for the most part, it's so that we can preserve our economy and our freedom. Can I, can, I, can I lovingly tell you that that doesn't matter as much as our lives glorifying God? Vance Havner has a, a little book, Messages on Revival. It's powerful. He says there's a wave of church activity today, but that's not revival. Church membership, church building, church attendance, and church work are at an all-time high, but the morals of the country are at an all-time low. That does not make sense. When church membership grows statistically, but the church members do not grow spiritually in proportion, that is not revival. The greatest need of the church today is not more members, more buildings, more money. The supreme issue is not even missions or evangelism, and I agree with that. Those are important, but that's not the supreme issue. The supreme issue, he goes on to say, is repentance and revival. Now, maybe we're getting close to the real problem here because I don't know that most Christians really want revival because it will impact and change your life. Again, what we, we're not wanting God to help us to, to be prosperous and happy and healthy and have everything that we want. What we ought to want is for God to move in and take over. In our, in our individual hearts and in our church. Finney, the great revivalist, said, O Lord, revive thy work. The ground of necessity for such a prayer is that men are wholly indisposed to obey. And unless God interpose the influence of his Holy Spirit, not a man on earth will ever obey the commands of God. We need help. No. We need him to take over. That's the bottom line. We need him to take over. Vance Havner, one of my favorites, said that revival is the renewal of the first love of Christians resulting in the conversion of sinners to God. It presupposes that the church is backslidden and revival means conviction of sin. Now listen to this, folks, because we're not talking about a, a gospel hootenanny. We're not talking about worship, working people up by music and Sad stories and that kind of thing. We're talking about brokenness. We're talking about conviction of our own personal sin. We're talking about repentance of that sin, turning from that sin. Conviction of sin and searching of hearts among God's people. When, when I was asking the question, you know, what's the problem in America? We're looking at it. Now, now, I know that's a hard pill to swallow. I know that's a hard pill to swallow. But God did not call 
unbelievers to be salt and light. He called believers. I don't know where to keep preaching or dance. Uh. <laughs> you don't want me to dance, believe me. Revival is nothing less than a new beginning of obedience to God. It's a breaking of the heart and getting down in the dust before him with deep humility and forsaking of sin. Time for another question. What keeps that from happening? Somebody said it back there already. We're more concerned about what you folks think of me than I am what he thinks of me. You know, we talk, James talks about confessing your faults one to another. We're, we're going to have a testimony time today. I, I, I dare you to get up and confess your faults. Quiet. It's really quiet in here. I, I think we're starting to see that in our Wednesday night. Uh, we break off and the guys, uh, we have a prayer time we, and we study. And I, we're starting to see in, our, in that group that guys are saying, yeah, man, I struggle with that. Right? A revival breaks the power of the world and of sin over Christians. The charm of the world is broken and the power of sin is overcome. He goes on to say, truths to which the hearts are unresponsive suddenly become living. Whereas mind and conscience may assent to the truth, when revival comes, obedience to the truth is the one thing that matters. Hamner goes on to say, and, and I believe this with all my heart, revival is simply a return to normal New Testament Christianity. I mean boiling all the fat off. And you're getting down with Acts 2, 42. The continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Basics. He goes on to say that most of us are so subnormal that if we ever became normal, we would be considered abnormal. I wish I had said that. Revival is a work of the Spirit among God's own people whereby they get right with God and with each other. When people are filled with the Spirit of God and obeying God, they don't need a revival, but we do, I think. I think it's the greatest need in our country and in the world. I, I think Morse did me a favor last week. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but <laughs> I found out two things. Number one, the video camera sees everything. And I found out something else. The microphone, even though it's that far away, picks up everything. And I don't know if you've seen the clip or not. Donna had him put it on there. Where's she at? But right after Donna quit playing, this was before the service started, right after she quit playing, I went, Ooh, oh, boy. <laughs> It was funny, but then it, I, I thought about that. It's not funny. Who, who in the world would want to come to church where the, the preacher's up there going, oh, boy. <laughs> I'm thinking, what a picture of the need that we have in our churches. You know... In enthusiasm is, comes from a compound word, in, enthusiasm, the, theistic, in God. Our, our faith should be so, exci so exciting that it's contagious. 
I, and I know what you're thinking. Oh, I don't know about that. I can never do that. I could never do that. Some of you are going to go home and you're going to watch later on today, it's the evening game, the Colts. And you're going to yell at your TV. And you're going to get excited when they score. If they score. We'll see. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I do it. I, I get excited about ball games. Well, but one of the things you got to understand is what we just call it. It's a ball game. How much more should we not be excited about the things of God? In fact, again, I think that's the real problem. I'm not going back to my notes right now. Because this is the real problem. We, we simply are not full of God. If, if we were filled with God, again, I'm not saying we would never watch a ball game or we would never go somewhere and do something. That's what Americans are all about, the next experience. Or we wouldn't be concerned about a new car or this or that, at least as much. Because if, if you're filled with God, everything else is trivia or trivial. It doesn't matter. And that's the way it ought to be anyway. That's normal Christianity. When God is living in us and producing life in us so much that we can't contain it. It overflows, splashes on other people. Now, I, I hope in the weeks ahead we look at this, but how do we, how do we get there? I'm going to go ahead and tell you how you get there. How do we get filled with God? You quit feasting on the husk of the world. I, I was, God has convicted me, and I'll, this is my confessing one of my faults to you. I, I do devotions every morning. But I'll be honest with you, some mornings I'm just half awake, and, I, and it's a dutiful thing. I read, I read my five verses, check that off. I said my, as Brother Tully calls it, my Polly want a cracker prayer. I've had my devotions. But I'm wondering, and this came out of our study on Proverbs about wisdom and wisdom coming from the Word of God. Is that, is that kind of Bible reading enough? Is reading our daily bread and the one verses in it? I, I was watching on, I don't know, YouTube or something, an advertisement for a, a program that will help you spiritually, and they talked about this great program that will help you read one chapter a day. You're, you're not, I, I tell you right now, you're not going to be filled with the fullness of God by simply dutifully reading one chapter or one verse or, or even five chapters a day. I, I'm purposing for next year, and I've done this before, I, I think if you'll read 10 chapters a day, I think you can get through the Bible two and a half times a year. Does that sound right, Brother Jim? At least two times a year, all the way through the Bible. So I, that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm throwing away my phone Bible program, and I'm going to read 10 chapters every day. And when I get to Psalm 119, I'm going to read that if it takes me all day. All right? You want to be filled with God, get filled with His Word. Read your Bibles. We fill our heads with all kinds of stu other stuff. We fill ourselves with television and YouTube and Facebook and, and I don't know, the kids are into other things. Uh, what are they? TikTok, yeah. And, uh, oh, well, I can't even, I don't do that other stuff, so I don't know. It's us. I, you know what I discovered? I don't have to watch every video on Facebook. I, I can be ignorant about that stuff and get along just fine. But we can't get along just fine 
without filling ourselves with the Word of God, which is synonymous with filling ourselves with God. I, I would suggest that you read Christian material. It's said that readers are leaders. If you're reading the right thing, there are some books out there. I, I got to bring home a whole sack of books yesterday, so I, I'm good for a while. There are Christian books out there because they're written by gifted Christian teachers that will change your life. We just we went through a study just recently on Wednesday night. On on uh, I'm having a senior moment. Trusting God. Change your life. Change your life. Take in Christian literature, a lot more of it. And when you're on YouTube, listen to sermons. You got to be discerning, but more prayer. Fill our heart tank with the things of God. That's how we're going to be revived, when we get filled with the fullness of God. What else, what else could we possibly want that would be more than that? I mean, he's there. Well, God's in, in my heart. Don't crowd him with stuff that doesn't matter. Let, let his presence expand in our hearts and take over every aspect of our being. That's, that's what, I, to me, I, I think simply, I think that's what revival's about. Where we, you know, there's three, uh, three main categories of sin. The second one is disobedience. We all know about that. The third one is distrust, when we don't trust God as we, sh as we should. But the first one's distraction. It's when we allow things to come into our life to take our focus off of Him. We got to get, I, I mean, gosh, well, I, don't know what, I don't know what to repent of. I'm there. If, if nothing else, folks, it's neglect. It's neglect of him and cultivating and allowing him to fill our lives. Lord, I guess it's un, a little bit unfair to these folks because what you deal with me about, I deal with them. Lord, we know, I think, I think from the, the questions asked at the beginning that all of us realize that the real problems in America are spiritual. And the real solution is Jesus Christ. God help us. We got to, the first step, Lord, is we got to get hungry. We got to desire more, more of you and more spiritual reality. I asked in the weeks ahead, Lord, that you would just do a, a special spiritual work in our hearts and lives. And Lord, we'll, we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. It's time for the Lord's Supper. So if you want to...